know this. Um, there's a fair amount of terminology and some background information I'm going to cover in this talk. Um, and then we finally get to the nuts and bolts of really what do we know what do we know about trees? Not much. Uh, it's very true, uh, actually, when it comes to the genetics. I mean what what we like with anything, we learned enough to be dangerous. And for certain circumstances, it works out very well. And you were mentioning a warehouser planting trees on Mount St. Helens that are now twice as big as the natural trees. And there's a, there's there's a reason for a that. There's a drawback to that because I'm, well, coming from a reman back, background. Um, I, I mean, I know there's a, there's a drawback to it, but I'll let you get to that. Well, and yeah, well, we'll we will get to that uh, because basically they have bred a specific strain of Douglas fir mm -hmm. that puts all of its energy into height growth. Just like we have specific uh, uh, breeds of cereal crops and corn, some of which is now genetically engineered, but they, before the genetic engineering, they were bred to produce larger seed heads, which is very important when you're trying to feed a large population off a limited piece of ground. There's a downside to it though, and uh, kind of stealing my thunder here before I even get Sorry. going, but no, that's all right. <laughs> the the downside time. is, um, you know, photosynthesis um, in northern hemisphere plants, which is a C3 process, operates at a certain rate. And it's based on how much sunlight hits the leaf and the efficiency of the leaf for capturing that sunlight. And then there's ways that plants can modify that by the enzymes, the quantity of enzymes they produce that move oxygen, carbon dioxide around and things like that. But there is a fixed rate. It's a chemical reaction, a biochemical reaction. Now, the difference between a tree that grows this tall next to one that's grown that tall, if everything is equal, is the one that's growing taller is taking most of that carbohydrate that it produces through photosynthesis and putting it purely into structural growth. The one that's only maybe that tall, again, is ev if everything is equal, is not only putting all that carbohydrate into growth, it's also putting it into pitch production and uh, terpene production and potentially reproduction, a whole lot of different things, okay? White side blister rust. Well, uh, we'll get to that too. We'll get to that. So, um, so there are, the thing is, everything works on an energy balance, okay? If you have a fixed amount of energy, or it's like, hey, it's like money. I mean, uh, plants are the ultimate capitalists. The currency is sugar, okay? So if you produce an abundance of sugar, it's a question of where you invest it. If you all invest it into one thing, well, as long as that one thing is working for you, you're going to outperform everybody else. But if you live in, an, in a variable environment, uh, say you're investing in the stock market, you know, and if you happen to invest all your eggs in Microsoft back when Microsoft was a nobody, you made out like a king and you were that super producing tree. But if you happen to invest all your money in Enron, you died, you know, as in the plant world. And so it is, you know, what genetics basically does is it can proportion the blueprint of that tree, proportion where the energy goes. And so this is some of the newer stuff, and I'm going to show you some information before I get ahead of my game here. So, well, welcome. I guess we better get started on this. Uh, my name is Peter Kolb. I'm the MSU Extension Forestry Specialist here. Uh, my background is actually in tree physiology, uh, ecology, and forest management, all, all three of those different things. And so I try to stay abreast of the different venues of research that are out there. And I thought, you know, uh, genetics is something that has changed a lot, uh, our knowledge of genetics in the last 10 years. Um, it, it used to be that tree genetics was about two things. Producing a tree that grows as fast as it possibly can so that you get wood volume as quickly as possible and monetary vol vol value back from it as quickly as possible. And the second thing was insect disease resistance, mainly disease resistance to certain uh, pathogens that were introduced to the United States like white pine blister rust uh, that killed off a lot of our native uh, uh, western white pines. And so there are specific breeding programs uh, that were used to try and find some that might have resistance and, and create a strain that is resistant. You know, the same thing's going on for American elm with Dutch elm disease or American chestnut with uh, chestnut uh, blight. Um, with 
really varying degrees of success, uh, not a whole lot in, in many of those, um, just because of how organisms interact. Uh, but really in the last 10 years, uh, with the ability to start mapping a genome, which is the entire genetic blueprint of an organism, uh, a lot of interesting things have come to light, and uh, there's been a lot of uh, interesting tree research as a result of um, the hypothesis of climate change, uh, particularly in Europe, um, where they're really, really worried about uh, the climate <coughs> affecting their bread and butter tree species, which is Norway spruce over there. I mean, it is, it's about, well, it used to be about 10% of uh, Northern European cover type. Uh, it's now about 40% of their forest cover, it produces 80% of their wood volume. So it's an incredibly important species. Uh, the only thing analogous to that in the United States is loblolly pine in the southeast, which is the bread and butter uh, softwood species for the, the uh, former paper industry down in the southeast. And they also cut lumber from it, uh, though uh, if you've ever seen lumber cut from loblolly pine, you, you kind of, compared to Montana lumber from Doug fir uh, or lodgepole pine, you kind of wonder uh, about that. So, uh, like I said, I'm going to run you through some real basics uh, about genetics. Um, it's kind of a, I, I don't know how much background you have in here, so if you have a lot of background, um, I apologize for simplifying things. Um, if you don't have a lot of background, I hope that I can present this in a logical sequence that is understandable. Um, it's one of those things that uh, can seem very, very mysterious. Oops, wrong one. Wrong one again. Just a moment. Here we go. All right. So where genetics comes to play in Montana, and we really don't have a lot of tree genetics work going on. We, we used to, uh, but we don't right now is uh, if you own forest property and you're managing it at any level. Uh, that management may come from, okay, some trees are killed by mountain pine beetle or something else, and you're either going to leave them as snags. If you start seeing too many trees die, then the question comes up. What can I do to keep my trees alive? Um, there may be questions about diversity. How do I get different species to grow here? I get a lot of questions. Can I plant uh, western white pine on my property? Or in central Montana, hey, can I get something else growing here? Uh, well, why won't Grand Fork grow here? Things like that. Uh, so th these are all questions that are somewhat related to genetic capabilities of trees. Dang it. And then, of course, uh, we see our landscapes uh, in Montana currently afflicted with a variety of pests and pathogens. And uh, if you look at those, and I'm sure you all do, whether it's your own property or someone else's, uh, I don't know if you've wondered this, but I wonder this all the time uh, when I'm driving across Montana and looking at properties. Uh, so why is this tree being hit and not that one? Uh, what about these two and not that one? I mean, what, how does that happen? Okay, and then if you wait a year, you go, oh, well, they just haven't gotten there yet because next year the trees around it might have been hit. Um, and then, of course, uh, a lot of it, it may be species specific. Uh, this is duck fir bark beetle, so it's not attracting, attacking the big ponderosa pines. And then also, uh, the way we view our trees and our forests is uh, most forests are a mixture of age classes and species, but we all I think have a natural tendency to be somewhat in awe of these big old trees that are there that have been there for 300 years, uh, in some cases 500 years. I mean, it's pretty hard to, even though there's a lot of volume and value in there, uh, it's pretty hard to take a chainsaw to one of those, you know, when you think that, you know, this thing has been here so long. Um, you know, so most of us tend to protect them as legacy trees, um, my, myself included. I have a few on my property. Um, but the question then comes, uh, also, well, what's so special about these trees that they lived that long, that they've gotten that big? Okay, is there anything special about it? Uh, is it a, a matter of circumstance? Um, is there something unique about that tree? And historically, uh, from um, breeding perspectives, uh, when uh, nurseries went into production for replanting, uh, where do they get the seed from? Do they just randomly go and collect seeds? Um, or do they go and try and find the best possible trees, just like we do breeding in chickens or dogs or horses, uh, where we want to have offspring that have the characteristics of these big old trees? That's uh, where we get the cone selection probably for the DNRC and any other 
any other greenhouse in this area, right? That's how they're making the choice. Well, they have a seed orchard. And I was working back for Champion back in the early 80s uh, when they were establishing their seed orchards. And they would go all over the countryside looking for these spectacular big trees. And they would collect a twig from that tree and graft it onto a little seedling. And that twig would then be cultivated into a mature tree and that's where they get their cones from. And the thought was if we collect uh, science called scion material, um, genetic material from a big tree in the Bitterroot and a big tree over in Thompson Falls and a big tree up in Columbia Falls, uh, we will have a really the plus trees, those that have the genetics for growing big and tall. And when we breed those together, we have a higher probability, almost a 60% probability, that the offspring will also grow that big and tall. Now, there's a lot of assumptions there, okay? And one of them is that this tree is so big and tall because it's genetically superior in the sense that it has the genetic code to make it grow that big and tall, okay? So superior from the sense that it'll grow taller faster than other trees. Um, and that's most of our seed orchards that we now collect seed from that produce commercial seed that you might, seedlings that you might buy and plant on your property are from such material. Is that site specific then? I'm sorry. I'm no, that's it. right. There's a problem here because they, with, with native uh, strains of, of king salmon that go up, up, up the Oregon coastline, um, I mean, they're short and fat ones. They don't have very far to go. Okay, and I mean in their migration, uh, boom, they, they spawn, boom, they die. Uh, they're different from the, the, the strain that goes up the Columbia River, clear up in Idaho, they're long and slender. Uh, let's see, what's the, the, the Hanford breach there? They're, they've got a much longer way to go. They're, they're a different fish entirely. So that's a, that's a site-specific uh, genetic adaption, okay? Absolutely. And so th this could possibly be happening right here and on the micro level, I mean, is it, will it variate from Drainage to drainage, quite possibly, my gosh. Excellent question, and one that I will answer with the rest of this lecture. Okay. Okay. Because th those are some of those core questions that need to be asked, that have been asked. Okay, I'll figure this out by the end of the talk here. So, uh, yes, sir. Um, did, did that big tree, uh, did you get the age of it and compare it to the ones around it so that uh, age is not a factor? I mean, well, that's another thing that we need to take into account. You know, is it that big just because it's older? Or is it that big because it's growing faster? Yeah. Uh, another one of those excellent questions that needs to be asked in all of this. So, um, and, and this of course plays a big role that uh, say we want to implement some thinning for fire hazard reduction or for health. And you know, most private forest landowners number one priority is to maintain a healthy functioning forest. Uh, and again, health can be defined in a lot of ways, but part of it is at least keeping your trees alive. So when we do some thinning, what are the criteria that we do to mark, okay, this tree's gonna go and this one's gonna stay? Uh, is it purely spacing? That we want a 20 foot spacing because uh, some guy down extension forestry told me that that was gonna be ideal for Ponderosa pine on this site. Um, so we just go, okay, here's 20 feet, and regardless of what the tree looks like, this one stays. Or do we look at, uh, do we kind of use that as a template, and then we look at the characteristics of the tree, um, and you know, what, what are the characteristics that we want to look at on the tree? And, and this is where it gets real sticky, uh, because uh, historically, what we're looking for um, is a tree that's dominant, taller than the rest, and that has a full crown. I mean, those are basically the characteristics. So, for example, uh, if we look at this ponderosa pine right here, that's tall and that nice thick needle retention, and more needle area means more photosynthetic capacity, better growth, and if it's growing better, it's healthier, and it has the carbohydrates perhaps, perhaps to defend itself from pests and pathogens. Versus we look at a crown like this or like that, where, okay, what's going on there? Uh, it's very thin. The tree is tall. Um, it happens to be in the right space, uh, so that's why we left it, and maybe it's just suppressed. Okay, it's been shaded by other trees and it couldn't develop that full crown. Uh, those are all very valid questions and to, to which there are not very good answers. So the ones that are kind of shaded, how many years will it take them to put that full crown on? 
Well, see if they're really going to grow. Excellent, excellent question. Every species is different. For ponderosa pine, typically um, a healthy tree will have needle retention of uh, three to five years. Okay, so it grows new needles in the spring, it's on the tip of the branch, and those needles stay productive and healthy and functional for up to five, sometimes even seven years before uh, the waxy coating that prevents water loss gets so thick that they can't absorb uh, carbon dioxide anymore and they become inefficient and the tree drops them. So on this tree, uh, it may only have two years worth of needle retention, or if it's very suppressed, the number of needles it grows every year are very minimal, and that's sometimes hard to tell, okay? But I would, I often refer to these branches, these branch ends as having kind of a Q-tip look to them. They're just kind of tufts at the end versus the, the bottle brush look where the whole twig has branches on it. So now the, the million dollar question to which I have a minimal answer to is, is this environmental or is this genetic? Okay, and that's impossible to truly answer, but there's maybe a few guidelines that can help you weigh the odds. And that's kind of what I'm going to try and give you a little bit of today. Um, the main thing is to remember is every tree species has evolved differently and has different strategies. And so the characteristics you're looking at on ponderosa pine may be very different than what you're looking on Douglas fir or lodgepole pine or western larch or white pine. And it gets more complicated than that as well. And so that's why I'm going to run through a little bit of uh, uh, genetic theory on this. Um, because what would be nice is someday, and it's possible that we will produce this, um, that you have a little probe and you stick into the tree and then you'll get a code off of it. And that code will tell you something about its genetics and help you make that selection process. And we'll get to what, what I'm talking about there. Uh, we're not there yet. But when humans, for example, we now have, uh, what is it, 23andMe? where you can send in a saliva sample and they will do a genetic genealogy on you and determine what your ancestry is. And they can also tell you what your predispositions are as far as the time bombs that are inside of all of us. Except for the USDA has prevented them from doing that because they're afraid that people will get this test back saying, oh, well, you're predisposed to uh, cancer, colon cancer. And they'll start treatments for colon cancer when they don't have it yet or something like that. Uh, to me, it's silly, but nonetheless, this is where genetics has gone, is that we can actually, where a genome has been fully mapped, that's your entire genetic code, uh, you can run tests on it now and see whether you have identified markers for certain things that they've identified, you know, certain types of breast cancer or prostate cancer or, you know, what, what have you. Um, so, good question. Somebody had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. So they don't have a way to They do, uh, but it's expensive. And the problem with our native tree species here in Montana is none of them have been genome mapped. Okay, um, only Norway spruce and loblolly pine have been mapped. And I'll explain why that is the case. It's a long, complicated, expensive process to do that, but there's no doubt that someday uh, we will get there. Now, there's another aspect to all this because when you're selecting trees for health and aesthetics and all these characteristics that we'll talk about uh, here a little bit later, there's also the regeneration aspect of it, okay? So these offspring down here, do they have the characteristics we want? And can you tell in young trees whether they have the characteristics we want? So, um, and is there a certain magical age where it's easier to tell than others? And again, there's some practical guidelines that one might follow on that. Uh, all of this is fairly theoretical and some of it is based on my 30 years of looking at these types of things. Um, but um, before we, we'll, we'll end this program with looking at those characteristics. But first I'd like to run through this a little bit for uh, those of you that have uh, not read up a lot on, on genetics or have and it's confusing. Um, it's a topic I've been studying for 30 years as part of physiology because it's interesting and I always have to refresh myself because I can 
uh, find myself lost in certain papers almost instantly because of the terminology that's often used. Um, and I wish they'd simplify it down. You have a question? Not at all. Please okay. So heredity. Um, this is really what we're talking about, the passing on of traits from one generation to the next. Uh, you know, a trait is a specific characteristic that's unique. Uh, it affects the way trees look, uh, how they function, <coughs> and traits can be or actually tip, uh, are inherited because they are in the genetic blueprint uh, of an organism. So it's more than likely going to pass the, that code or that blueprint on. And so in trees, here's a prime example. <clears throat> Blue spruce, okay, sold ornamentally. One of the common questions I get is people will buy a beautiful blue spruce, plant it, and after several years it turns green. And they call me up, and what can I do to turn it blue again? And, you know, tongue in cheek, I might say, well, wait for cold weather, but no, I mean, it's, um, um, this is a genetic trait that affects the, the structure of the wax that's on the needles. When the wax is all curly on the, on the needles, that coating that prevents needles from losing water, it reflects mainly blue wavelengths, which are short wavelengths. When that wax uh, loses that short curly nature and becomes more flat, then the light reflected is green. That's all there is, the difference to it. And so some trees are genetically, have been selected for because they tend to look blue. And they're bred, and this is what produces the nursery stock of Colorado blue spruce, okay? But within that genetic code is also other genes um, that may be dominant or recessive, and we'll talk about that, that after a period of time change the composition of that wax and turns green. Now if you want to turn a blue spruce green, just spray it with oil, okay? Uh, uh, horticultural oil, and it'll turn it green. But then there's another aspect uh, that has been used historically a lot in selecting genetics in trees, and that's frost tolerance, okay? When do they get hardy, and at what cold temperature can they get to? If you do any kind of horticultural work, you'll know that there are different plant zones, okay? We're in zone four, three to four here in Missoula. Great Plains, you're definitely in zone three. And what that means is how cold can it get before the plant starts to die? Because plants have adaptations, they produce fatty acids uh, and concentrate sugars to keep their cytoplasm from freezing or the water in the cytoplasm from freezing, and when water freezes, it expands and blows the cells apart, okay? So here is, this is Missoula. I just took this picture a couple days ago. I've been meaning to. I've been watching this all winter long. This gentleman, it's uh, off of um, Foothill Road there, uh, right behind uh, um, Cabela's, if you want to see it for yourself. Um, and last fall, you may notice or may have remembered that we got hit in November by that uh, really, really cold snap, 10 below zero here in Missoula, okay? Uh, that's really unusual here. And a lot of trees weren't hardened off by that time, which means they hadn't prepared for that cold weather. And so here's a population of spruce trees. I can only assume bought from the same nursery, all Colorado blue spruces to make this property boundary. And some of them are blue. You have turned green in the meantime because of that waxy thing. And now when this super cold snap hit, some of the trees got hit by it and others did not. And so, and that's because, again, uh, uh, cold tolerance and cold hardiness is very strongly genetically programmed in a tree. So we get into these tree selection guidelines, okay, where most tree selection guidelines are based on how much cold they can tolerate. And how, when they start to go dormant. So zone three trees, for example, are genetically programmed to start shutting down and going into a winter dormancy uh, probably the beginning of September. Zone four trees are programmed to go start going and preparing for winter, um, winter or cold tolerance probably the end of September, okay? So this is how do I have my zones backwards on here? But this is how uh, cold tolerance and when they go dormant is very tightly genetically controlled. And this is why sometimes people will buy exotics. Uh, say they're down in California and they find this beautiful uh, pine tree, a Jeffrey pine, and say, oh, gee, I'd like to have that. Or sequoias. We had these big planting trials for sequoias across Montana and Idaho about 30 years ago. And they did great 
for about five years until we got one of these super early cold snaps and it killed every single one of them. There's two alive in the University of Idaho Arboretum still and they're, they're big, but it's in a protected microsite. Ostries, another one. You see them in gurneys. Tree will grow uh, 20 feet in one year. Okay, it's a hybrid poplar is all it is. And it's a hybrid poplar that is programmed not to shut down photosynthetically. And it grows more because it keeps cranking photosynthetically producing sugar and then it gets cold and their cells freeze and it dies. You know, and there it is. So, you know, these are traits that uh, horticulturists, nursery breeders will specifically breed for to propagate uh, a group of trees that looks a certain way. You know, purple leafed um, uh, maples. It's a Norway maple that produces purple leaves. Okay, that's been bred for because it's a specific characteristic. Does that make the tree more robust or hardier or better growing? Typically not. When we select for an ornamental feature, it is usually something that detracts from the overall robustness. Um, think of Irish wolfhounds, okay? That's the same type of process. Dogs have been bred to be really big uh, for chasing down wolves and killing them, okay? But in breeding for that characteristic, you've also brought along all sorts of unwanted things with it. And typically, the more highly bred something is, the more inbred it is, and I'll talk about that a little bit more too, which brings all sorts of uh, negative consequences with it. So, all right, moving on. So, uh, I already talked about this, um, I wanted this because historically with trees, we wanted, we picked the tallest trees as our superior genetics because they grew taller. The other thing we look for are those that, in cases of western white pine blister rust or Dutch elm disease, chestnut blight, trees that showed some resistance to these diseases. So, and you know, how do we keep track of these things? It's called a pedigree chart. So we have a male is a square, female is a circle, um, and then we have all sorts of symbols that we can use to denote, denote certain things. So this might be uh, black hair and blonde hair or something like that for example. And then as when we breed those two together, we keep track of which offspring uh, carry on these characteristics. And sometimes it's pretty simple, okay? It's, it might be sex related. Um, so the male, uh, say, has a certain characteristic denoted by the straight line, and the female has this other characteristic denoted by a cross. It might be eye color, hair color, um, earlobes or in trees, uh, blue, you know, this one might be blue and this one might be green. Okay, in the simplest situation, this is uh, sex linked. So basically, all, in the offspring, all the males have this characteristic of the male and all the females have the characteristic of the female. Okay, so that's a super simple way in which something might be transferred where it's linked to the X and the Y chromosome. Now, it can get uh, more complicated because a lot of times there's multiple traits. So here maybe we're, we're dealing um, with uh, hair color and something else, hair color and eye color, okay? And so when we look at it, um, the males still have um, um, the hair color, but the eye color is not linked to the sex, okay? So we're, here we have uh, a female that has uh, the different pigment, but you know this other characteristic is still linked to uh, the sex. Does that make sense? Okay. Pete, this is, this is, you're, we're running into some money here now. I can tell you right now, this is time intensive and cost intensive. Just oh, absolutely. Breeding programs are that way. I mean, and that's why companies like Monsanto. What did Monsanto do? How did they become the, the, the richest company on earth? Well, they developed an herbicide called Roundup, okay? and they genetically engineered a wheat strain that is Roundup resistant. So here you sell the herbicide that now you don't have to chop weeds, okay? You plant and you spray Roundup across the whole land, it nukes it, kills everything, and except for the wheat that you want. So now a farmer that used to have plant certain acres and was limited by that acreage because they had to go back and they had to control weeds, okay? Now is limited only by the size of the equipment and how fast that equipment can go through and process it. And this is why, um, interestingly enough, um, I read a lot of different things. Um, someone did a test on flour across the earth, across the globe, for traces of Roundup. And they found out that 90% found out, found that of the flour sold worldwide, whether it's Vietnam or Peru, 
United States or China, 90% of it has traces of Roundup in it. Okay, so this is how. Well, and they they say that Roundup in the air like inhibits fetal development. But there's now they're finding, but Monsanto they did that. They marketed it, but then they didn't do follow up. Well, this is That's the problem is follow up is expensive. Right. Well, and this goes into a whole different arena with uh, genetically engineering. The European Union will not import or buy anything that is genetically engineered. Because when you start messing with genetics, um, it's the analogy I use is like a spider whip. When you tweak on one strand, the whole thing shifts. Now, the potential benefits are huge. There are some potential negative consequences. And so what are all the negative consequences? Oh my god, when you start messing with genetic code, uh, and as I'll show you, there are three billion pairs rungs in the human DNA, okay? Three billion, okay? So when you mess with one thing, who knows what you're messing with the other. Now, on the flip side is, there's a lot of that natural messiness built into it. So, you know, if you, you know, go just say you say, okay, I'm not gonna go with refined sugar, I'm only gonna eat maple syrup. Well, maple trees have certain toxins in them as well. And if you concentrate them in the body, God knows what you're gonna come down with, okay? So that's, you know, they say moderation is the key to everything, but that's a whole different topic, but certainly you can get into uh, stir up a hornet's nest with messing with genetic code. And so, you know, we go back to uh, this pedigree chart where you go through multiple generations and most be breeding programs were developed based on these types of charts where you're looking for certain things that are passed on genetically uh, by breeding. Now we can circumvent breeding because now we can clone stuff. Okay, and you can do that naturally. Uh, aspen clones, you just cut snip twigs off and stick them in the ground. Willow is the same thing. Uh, subalpine fir actually clones itself, it's called layering. It'll drop, lay its branches on the soil surface and it'll root itself, okay? Uh, Western red cedar will do that. So again, there, um, this is the his history behind genetics. And so you, know, you can't talk about genetics without, of course, mentioning uh, um, uh, Ge Gregor Mendel, who was the Augustinian monk who did his first experiments with peas. Uh, and, you know, what he came up with is that there are traits are um, either dominant or recessive, okay? And I'll use uh, glacier lilies as an example. You know, a beautiful spring flower in Montana, most glacier lilies produce one flower. But occasionally you'll find some that produce two. And the most I've ever found is one that produced five flower heads on it. Okay, so now is that genetically controlled or not? I have no idea, but I'm just using that because the pattern is there and it's, it would seem to be that way that 95% of glacier lilies have one flower. Uh, some of them have two or more. So the thing with traits and genetics is for it to become a common thing, it has to have an advantage. Okay, so the advantage of having multiple flowers is you can produce five times as many seeds, right? The disadvantage is it takes a heck of a lot more energy to produce five times as much seed, and so actually in producing the flower heads, this plant may be robbed of so much energy that none of those seed are viable, okay? And versus one seed, or one flower head, you're putting all your eggs into just those few seeds and you have a greater probability of those seeds surviving. The downside is that <clears throat> If something happens to this one flower, this plant's out of luck. If something happens to this one flower and this one, it has four others that may have seeds on it, okay? So there's pros and cons to everything that's out there, but it's abundance. How frequently you find it is typically an example of the advantage it has in the environment it's growing in, okay? So most uh, genetic traits that you see um, are there because it gives the plant an advantage in the specific circumstance in which it's growing, okay? That can, that can be, it's, it's in a controlled environment, so therefore it is desirable to us. So therefore, in a, on a tree plantation in New Zealand, this partic particular tree is gonna grow because it, it, it's, its dominant genes are gonna be accentuated because we desire that they be accentuated. You get on the other side of the mountain in New Zealand, they die. Well, without, without us being there, right? Sure. 
Okay. And this is how natural selection works naturally over millions of years. Okay. Now we speed it up by picking certain traits and planting them here and there. And there may be some negative consequences. There may be some positive consequences. And if I go back to cereal grains, where the cereal grains we use now are all highly bred for putting all their energy into producing a mass of seed that produces a maximum of flour per acre. Okay. There are negative consequences to that because it's very simplified. Um, and the flour is very simplified, the sugar is very simplified. However, the positive consequences, and the reason we do that is we can't feed the people on, on, on Earth right now. And so you have to produce a certain amount of grain. And from USDA, we just got the prediction that by 2050, Montana will have to produce three times as much beef as it currently does to meet world demand. Good luck. Well, right. You know. So what, what's going to happen is, OK, to meet that demand, maybe we may just end up a big clone of a big beef muscle round that just grows attached to tubes. Who knows, you know? Now, what are the negative consequences? Well, they're not eating grass and grains, and they may not have the complexity of proteins and sugars in it that perhaps we need to remain healthy. So again, your head can spin pretty quick on this. You had questions? On the uh, other plant back there, the, the one that had the five heads, that plant's a lot bigger than those, that other plant with one. Now, the nutrients must have come in that. Did it, because of the nutrients, did it make that five heads instead of one? Good question. <coughs> Environment inf can influence genetic control. And it's real interesting because uh, I take these pictures on my property. We've lived in there now for 20 years. And these multiple headed uh, erythroniums tend to grow in one location. Now, is it because the genetics happens to be right there and they're just propagating one another? Or is there something special about that site that allows that to happen? So you hit on one of those key characteristics that I'll reemphasize on here, is what we see is a combination of environment and genetics. And teasing apart which is responsible for which is tricky business. Very hard to do. Uh, and there's ways to do it, but it's very, very labor intensive. All right, so unless I get I'm already behind schedule, but I'll try and catch up. So dominant trait is a trait that's always expressed or shown. Uh, brown hair, brown eyes, right-handed is a dominant trait in humans, for example. Okay. A recessive trait is a trait that is covered up or seems to disappear. It's blonde hair, blue eyes, left-handedness in humans. Okay. We know a fair amount of genetics about humans because it's a topic of interest uh, to us. Now, how that happens is basically it, it's in the genetics or the genes. Okay, A trait is controlled by the genes. Uh, the genes come from both parents in most cases unless an organism can clone itself, which some do. Okay, And <clears throat> the genes are on our, are basically chromosomes is uh, where those genes are located. So chromosomes are what are in every cell in your body. Uh, and every cell, or most every cell in a plant or any animal or, or any organism. Now, bacteria and viruses are a little different. Uh, in they're, they're much more, I would like to say, primitive organisms. Their DNA is a little bit different, but still plays the same way. And so <clears throat> a gene is simply a chemical sequence on a specific location on a chromosome. And I'll explain a little bit further. Uh, humans, this is a human uh, chromosome chart. Uh, we have 23 chromosomes, and the 23rd one, whether it's XX or XY, of course, determines sex. Okay, XX is female, XY is male. Now, if we take one of those chromosomes and unravel it, okay, it's a very tightly packed, what you end up with is this twisted stepladder uh, called DNA. Okay, and DNA um, is basically the code on it is there's four base pairs. Um, on here, and they're arranged on different uh, different patterns on that on that twisted stepladder. Okay, all that this thing is is a template for proteins. Okay, and a few other things. So uh, the bases on there: are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Uh, so if we go back up here, that's what these letters. And there's two sides to it. Okay. Typically, one side comes from the male, one side comes from the female. Okay, and they, they recombine. Um, and 
to produce, well, go back. In the human genome, there are 3.3 billion base pairs. Okay? 3.3 billion. Now, a base pair itself isn't a gene. What uh, a gene is, just another way of looking at this. Yeah, stop. Here we go. If we unravel this chromosome into this, a gene is a certain section on a DNA strand, and that section is simply a template for a protein or a precursor to a protein or an enzyme, okay? So this is, think of this thing, you know, as, I don't know what 3.3 billion stretched out would be, probably half the equator of the Earth or something like that. I mean, it's an unimaginable number. But basically, <clears throat> say gene 2 here is a template on which other organic, the sugars you eat and the vitamins you eat, reassemble to form a specific protein. And that specific protein is then translocated into your body to make membrane on your eye, or your eye color, or a strand of hair, or a fingernail, okay? So all of your organs on you or a tree, every single thing on there, its Lego block that builds it, is formed on this DNA strand, okay? Now the interesting thing about DNA strands is they're not perfect. So we have 3.3 billion pairs, base pairs that make up this template, but only half of it is actively functional. So half of it doesn't get used. It's just there, and it's maybe an artifact of some earlier stage of uh, organism development. And now, you know, I don't mean to offend anybody, you know, with your religious beliefs or anything like that. And there is a way that this could fit together because to, humans are unique, hopefully, from animals. And so when you look at the complexity, there are certainly, there is uh, um, the belief that there was some intervention in how this was organized to create a human being, okay? So that's how it can fit into different belief structures in there. I don't want to get into that debate because um, there are many different sides to it, but sir. But gene one and gene two are very specific for this chromosome, and there are other? Correct. Gene three, gene 180? Correct. Okay. okay. Though, as I said, about across all organisms, roughly 60%, if you compare the DNA, 60% is identical with all higher organisms. We share about 60% of the same DNA because our cell structure is the same, uh, or it functions basically the same way as any animal plant cell structure does. And to some level, even how a plant cell structure works, okay? Now you get down to bacteria and viruses, that, that, that's things go away. So the further you go down the line in, in complexity and uh, development, the less likely there is. Now between us and say, you know, the comparison of orangutans and gorillas and chimpanzees, because we are somewhat similar, there's actually about, a, we shared 98% of our DNA is similar. But 2% of 3.3 billion still is a difference of 220,000 different genes on there. And that is roughly the difference between him and me is we have 20,000 potential differences in our genetic makeup. Okay, so, so are there outside factors that will, I, I read about something like this, outside factors that will make certain parts of genes turn on and, and off? And yes. There was, there was some, there was in Time Magazine, there was something about this. Yeah, well there's, this is extremely simplified because okay. you just pointed the thing, what makes this gene active or not? So we talked about dominant and recessive genes, okay? So a dominant gene is most simple traits, eye color, for example, are determined by two genes, okay? One from the male side, one from the female side. The dominant ones are the ones that express themselves, so brown is dominant. So if you have a brown gene and a blue gene, 
for eye color, you will have brown eyes. Okay? If you have both blue genes, you'll have blue eyes. The recessive typically only shows itself when it is what we call homozygous, and I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me run through this a little faster. So an individual needs two genes for each trait, one gene from each parent. Okay? A gene pair, again, terminology is called an allele. Don't worry about it if you don't know this, but if you do further reading, it, the terminology can get to you uh, pretty quickly. Okay, so how are genes expressed? Um, they're either what's called homozygous or heterozygous, so let me move on to that. So homozygous means that you have the same genes from both sides. Okay, so in the case for being tall, let's look at trees or humans. If the gene from the male and the female are both the dominant T for tall, it means the offspring will be tall. Okay, if on the other hand, um, there's a recessive gene, dwarfism, okay? In trees, just like humans, it's a, not a common characteristic, and it's carried by a lot of people. But if your genes happen to match up for this recessive thing, the small t, then the offspring will have, be shorter. My nephew is deaf, he was born deaf. And it's because there is a recessive gene in my family and my brother's wife's family from Eastern Europe that causes the cilia in your ear, uh, in your inner ear not to develop. It's a rare recessive gene unless your both ancestors are from there. And he was born deaf because those recessive genes happen to come together. Now modern science, he's got a cochlear implant and he hears just fine, he talks just fine and you think he's got a cell phone on but other than that, you know, he's a normal kid. Uh, so, but nonetheless, this is how this stuff works. So uh, heterozygous, on the other hand, is when you have, um, say for tall and short, you have a dominant gene and you have a recessive gene. Okay, this is like uh, my brother and my family has this recessive gene for deafness. Okay, we don't know it's there until we pair up with someone that also has that recessive gene and they happen through Hertz happenstance to pair up and then that gene is expressed. Yes? So, does a, can a recessive gene become dominant or are they always recessive? It's just a matter of the pairing. Excellent question. Let me, let me answer that, okay? So, how do we predict offspring? It's called a Punnett square, okay? So, what we do is we pair up both parents, okay? So, if both parents are what we call heterozygous, remember, homozygous is where they have the same gene. Heterozygous is where they have a dominant and a recessive. So then we do the simple math on here that if you have offsprings, you have a one in four chance that they will be homozygous for the dominant gene. Okay? They have a one in four chance that they will be homozygous for the recessive gene. And they will have a two in four chance that they will be heterozygous. Okay? However, in the case where you have a dominant gene and a recessive gene, in this, three out of four offspring, by probability, will not show the recessive trait. Okay? So, I don't know whether I have the recessive gene for deafness in mind. I might be this, or I might be that. And there's no way to tell unless you map your genetic structure for that. Okay? Now, this is extremely simplified. Because think that you have the difference between him and me is 220,000 of these genes, okay? And the differences that may be in there. So it gets, you can imagine the, the scale. So if we just look at, go back to Mendel um, and his study with peas, okay? And here we're looking at two different characteristics. Um, the color of the pea pod and the color of the pea itself, okay? So that's expressed by the color of the pea pod is a big G, little G, uh, or is the G, and the color of the, of the PC is the Y, okay? So what you get, and this is just two different genes, and you do this Punnett square thing is, you can see that if you're, if, uh, you're dominant for uh, green and dominant for yellow, you'll have a yellow pea seed and a green pea pod, okay? So those are the dominant genes. So if you have any combination of dominance in there, you'll have a yellow pea and a, a green pea pod. On the other hand, if you're homozygous for the recessive green color, then your pea pod will be yellow, 
and you can have dominant uh, homozygous or a yellow pea. The bottom line is that what you see is the majority will be the green pea and the yellow, or the, green, the yellow pea and the green pea pod, because those are the dominant genes in here. Now imagine these are just two different genes. Now imagine if you're trying to map out 220,000 genes, the different combinations that you and factors you have in here. Okay, and this is again very simplistic because this assumes that this gene will not interact with that gene. Okay, that these are simple triggers that make differences in things. That should be possible now though with programming. Oh, it is. That's why 23 and me, you can send your genetics in and they can check for things they know about and they can tell you about genetic predispositions you have. But there are limitations and that's why the USDA said no. You can't tell people that, guess what, someday you're going to die of melanoma because you have happen that gene because it gets complicated in a hurry because this is assuming that this gene and this protein, the gene is just produces a protein for yellow color or green color, okay? So, but it's assuming that when this protein is produced and it is transported to the site of pigmentation, that there's no other interactions going on. Which is why now you hear about people like they, you get a disease that no one in your family has and they say this is a genetic, this is a hereditary disease that got triggered. Yes. I've heard that a couple times recently and they used to not say that. So, um, yeah, and we're getting into the nuts and bolts of this because this does, believe it or not, relate back to trees and how we view our selection process on trees. So, you know, bottom line is parents pass on copies of their DNA to their offspring. Uh, the offspring develops based on the coding they get. Um, offspring are therefore similar to parents but different due to the many possible combinations of four bases that are in there. So, like, I have two daughters. All of their good traits come from me and all their bad traits come from their mother. Okay, that's, however selective we want to look at that. What she, did she say to that? <laughs> <laughs> said, you better go teach your class and we're going to go do something fun. Uh, all right. So, now, some more terminology. A phenotype is the way that we look or appear. Okay, so when we go back to those Punnett squares, um, the phenotype here is simply green pods, yellow pods, yellow seed, green seed. Okay, and a phenotype can be hard to track back to a single genetic characteristic. If it does, is, it's simple to figure out, okay? But a lot of times they're, they're linked in different ways. Okay, a genotype, on the other hand, is the genetic makeup of that trait. So, you know, if we use the, the, the coding, capital B is for dominant pure brown um, versus capital B, little b would be heterozygous for br brown blue, and small b's would be blue, okay, in this particular example. Makes sense, right? So, you know, we can look at, for example, uh, now different combinations. If one parent is homozygous uh, for dominant uh, uh, right handedness and the other parent is heterozygous for right handedness, all of the offspring will basically be right handed because when they cross, there's no way to end up with a pure RR. Okay? So, and for many of our characteristics, this is what's there. And that's why, like in my brother's case, he had that rare gene for deafness that was heterozygous and he and his wife, well, there you go. Chances are if they had another child, the child would not be deaf, okay? On the other hand, if you have something like height, tall versus short, and both parents are heterozygous, there's always that mathematical probability that 25% of the offspring will be short and three quarters of the offspring will be tall, be, will express that dominant gene. And so, um, you know, we can do all sorts of different, um, if one parent is homozygous for dominant trait and the other is homozygous for a recessive trait, all the offspring will show the dominant trait. So, uh, you know, and that's like when you're, when you're breeding uh, animals or dogs, uh, colors, uh, horse colors, palomino, things like that, uh, you'll never get a palomino from this kind of a cross. A palomino is pure recessive, but you can only breed them, you need a certain combination of parental colors to end up with a palomino. I forget what they are. Um, for me, horses only come in three colors, you know, white, beige, and brown. And my wife, who's a horse person, 
says, uh, laughs at me, but nonetheless. Um, so again, I guess I stressed that point enough. Now, incomplete dominance gets this other question, and that is, what if genes are not purely dominant or purely recessive? So if you have a flower that has dominant gene for red, and another flower that is crossed with, uh, that has a dominant gene for white, you end up with a pink flower. Okay? This does happen, okay? more often than not. And that's why genes need to be figured out and mapped before you can end up with these breeding programs for specific things. Okay, and um, well, before I get to this, so now how do allele frequencies change? This is different than evolution. Okay, this is simply how does it say in humans? How did populations develop that are blue-eyed and blonde-haired? and other populations that are black-haired and black-eyed, okay, and everything in between. So there's different processes. Mutation is when on that DNA strand, something changes the sequence on there, okay? 99.99999% of all mutations are lethal or, or don't go anywhere, okay? They're worthless. The, the body physiology can't make any sense out of it. Some of them may be lethal. Only something like one out of 100,000 mutations has a positive thing that may allow that organism to exhibit a new trait. Okay, twisty needles versus straight needles. Okay, so this is how new genetics develops. It is an extremely slow process because, again, think of this genome that has in humans 3.3 billion sequences on it. You change one thing on it chances are it's going to mess up everything. Okay, It's like randomly opening up the hood of your car and saying, OK, I don't think this wire is, is needed, so I'm going to disconnect it. Okay, It's usually not a positive thing. Okay, <laughs> So natural selection, process, this is evolutionary adaptation. This is where, um, say, a tree growing in super hot environments has, there's a mutation that makes the needles produce a wax that's white in color the blue and blue spruce. What that does is results in most of the sunlight reflecting off of the needle rather than being absorbed by the needle, which gives that tree an advantage in a super hot environment because it prevents it from overheating. Now that tree that has that mutation will survive where the other ones will not, and it will more than likely pass that genetics on to some of its offspring. And the offspring that have that mutation will survive and the other ones will not. So over time, you end up with an abundance of trees that have this white waxy coating on their needles. This is how natural selection selects for certain characteristics. That's why, for example, Douglas fir, the coast of Washington, is a different subspecies of the Douglas fir we have here. Okay, in Europe, they call our Douglas fir the gray Douglas fir, and the coastal Douglas fir, Douglas fir the green Douglas fir. The green Douglas fir grows in a very humid environment. Water is not an issue. Its main competitive thing is light, so it has to grow tall fast. The Douglas fir that grows out here, if it only puts all of its energy growing tall and we come into summer drought, what happens is its cell structure embolizes. Okay, The water stress causes the water column to snap and you get air pockets in it and it dies. Okay, So our Douglas fir doesn't grow tall as fast as the coastal Douglas fir. But if you plant coastal Douglas fir out here, aside from the cold tolerance issue, if we have drought, it will die because it does not have the capacity to dry down the way that our Douglas fir does. Okay? They are the same species because you can interbreed them and they will produce viable offspring. Okay? That's one of those basic tests for whether it's a species or a variation. They will produce ver viable offspring. That way may have a combination of these characteristics. Is that particular example? <coughs> Of fir trees here and there. Is that are those like physical matters of distance and time for, for moisture to travel? And so it's the size thing? of the vessels that conduct water. So the Douglas fir on the coast, the size, the diameter is larger. And the larger it is, the easier it is for water tension to break in it. But that size also allows it to transport water more efficiently, which it allows it to grow taller faster. Our in ours, the size is smaller, denser wood basically. And so it doesn't break that water column, but squeezing water through a smaller straw is harder. 
So it takes more effort for the tree to pull water up to a certain height and our dug fir won't get as tall and they won't grow as fast. So Did they look the same though initially? Um, they look a little differently because there's other things that go along with it. Wax coating. See ours are called gray Douglas fir because the light reflects off the needles a little differently because they have a thicker cuticle wax coating which is another drought adaptation. Mm -hmm. The dug fir on the coast has a greener color to it because it doesn't invest all that into that wax layer. Mm -hmm. So there are more than one difference. Um, and the longer populations are apart, the more they may change through what's called genetic drift. When a population is isolated and a small population, there are chances that just out of randomness, certain characteristics get bred out. Okay? There's just a chance that the small population that was left, say we take the population in this room and only two of us survive a cataclysm and we're both blonde, then there is a predisposition for our population to develop a greater percentage of blonde. Okay, so, and that's uh, how genetic drift works. The more isolated a population is, over time, the more genetically unique it will become. Okay, now these are big issues in endangered species because if you go into one drainage and you have uh, um, cutthroat trout that have four spots in their cheek, and you go in another drainage where those cutthroat trout have two spots on their cheek, are they a different species? Are they a different variety? Are they a different ecotype? Do they need to be protected separately because they're genetically unique? These are tough questions that we wrestle with oh, now. You're splitting peas, you're splitting hairs now. Well, yeah, but if you want to, you know, in Montana, because of the way our landscape sits, you go into every drainage, you're going to find something genetically unique because for <laughs> migration is the equalizer. It keeps genetics similar. But if you limit migration, and so how do trees, how are trees limited in migration? Mm -hmm. Our mountains run north-south, our wind patterns are west to east, okay? Which means we have mountain ridges between valleys and those mountain ridges are barriers to pollen and seeds. So when you have that kind of configuration, like northern Rockies, every single drainage may be genetically unique because of genetic drift. Oh, wow. Okay? Oh, now, wow. There's pros and cons to that, because now we're getting in the nuts and bolts of all of this, and I gotta hurry up here because I got half hour left to cover a lot of interesting things here. Um, but if you have one drainage where all your lodgepole pine is hit by gall rust, and another drainage where it's not hit by gall rust, is there an advantage to mixing, getting some genetic diversity into that? Okay, every time we go out and select trees, we are, whether we like it or not, doing some genetic selection. But it gets even more interesting than that. So let's go into this. Now, selection for certain characteristics uh, can occur uh, quite rapidly across generations, especially if you have small populations. So this is a map of uh, frequency of a specific gene, the original population, where you take a small group and you plant it somewhere else, and when it, whenever there's even a slight nuance, that nuance gets multiplied with every generation. So this is the frequency of a specific gene in a population. Uh, I forget whether it's trout or what, but it's based on actual organism, where the parent population, if you look at across the entire United States of this species, this is the gene frequency. But when you go take two individuals from that population, or ten individuals from that population, they plant it somewhere else. Say the Great Plains. This is uh, green ash from Pennsylvania. And you plant it out in the high line of Montana in a windbreak. And those ten trees will then reproduce. With each generation, you lose more and more and more frequency of this particular gene, just out of happenstance, because the original population you had in there had a minor amount of this, and by breeding happenstance, it, it disappears. This is how you get different variations. This is how you can breed weaknesses into things. This is how you can breed strengths into things. Okay, And really, the only way to find out which one might be best adapted for Montana is to take all these populations, plant them out there, and let the ones that are weak die, let the ones that are strong survive, and then you start crossbreeding those, and then you have a Montana variety of green ash that's designed to survive what we have here. 
The downside is if you take that Montana green ash and say, okay, it's doing well in Montana, let's plant it in Colorado. Well, Colorado has different circumstances. And it may do terribly there because what you've ultimately done is by selecting for one site characteristic, you're selecting against all this other stuff that's out there. All of the, the, the robustness of that species to adapt to different environments. So this is called heterozygote superiority. So we go back to homozygote is when <clears throat> in the simplistic form, both genes are the same, right? Either for blue eyes or brown eyes or tall or short, whatever. <clears throat> a heterozygote has a gene for this dominant trait and a gene for this recessive trait. Here's the things that we have actually found out now uh, with all this gene mapping is that just because one gene is showing dominance, that you say you have brown eyes, it doesn't mean that the blue gene is turned off. The blue gene is still producing proteins for blue eyes. They're just being overshadowed by the brown pigment. pigment. The beauty in all of this is, with this heterozygote superiority, is say we have a tree that, again, you're looking at a million or more genes on it, okay? If a tree has been bred selectively for one thing, tall, okay? So you're breeding and breeding and breeding for trees that grow tall. What you're breeding for is a tree that has a disproportionate number of its genes as homozygous, right? Just because you're breeding for a selective trait. The problem is that, say, for changing environment, our environment gets warmer, global warming. We have a new disease come in, all those things those recessive genes are still working. They're just dominant. And we don't know what all the qualities of those recessive genes are, except that the more genetic diversity you have, the greater your probability and likelihood is that you have some mechanism to deal with something that you don't know about. Does that make sense? Okay, it's an investment portfolio, okay? You have your stocks in only three massive producers, or you have it diversified, okay? The more you diversify, the less you're gonna see great, huge gains. Because, you know, if you only have 5% of your stocks in Microsoft 30 years ago, well, that one did well, but in the meantime, Enron went under, and so you balanced out in the meantime. But the more diversification you have, the more likely you are to maintain yourself at a certain level. Whereas the more you're specified into something, the less likely you are able to adapt. So let's use dogs, for example. All dogs basically originated from a common ancestor, somewhat like a coyote or a wolf. Not exactly, because coyotes and wolves have gone down their own genetic pathway. But wolves and coyotes, coyotes especially, are known to be adaptable everywhere, right? City of Los Angeles, North Slope of Alaska. The reason they're so adaptable is they have this tremendous genetic diversity built into them. Okay, and so those genes become activated or deactivated depending on the stimulus that's there or there's a breeding selection going on. That you'll have two coyotes travel a thousand miles into a different environment, they'll have ten pups, two will survive. The other eight won't, okay, that's genetic selection. The other flip side is that if all those genes are being activated by environmental stimulus, that's called a generalist versus a specialist, then they just have this greater adaptability built into them because their genes will turn on and off. Trees are the same way, okay? Jerry Rayfeld, who spent his lifetime looking at genetics of Northern Rockies conifers, came up with the term generalist and specialist. Now he, to this day, hates the term because it oversimplifies. <coughs> but larch is a generalist, okay? It has this tremendous genetic robustness, and you think about it. Larch is adapted to cataclysmic events, it makes its living by having a light seed that can find a burned area 20 miles away. It has a lot of pollen and seed transfer all across the Northern Rockies. Okay? It's a generalist. It, its genetic diversity is built into it. Douglas fir is a specialist. Okay? Every 500, or 500 yards elevation change, you have a unique population of Douglas fir with respect to cold tolerance which is why there is seed transfer guideline for Douglas fir. It has to come out of this specific elevation. Ponderosa pines in between, okay? Ponderosa pine seed doesn't move a long distance, it just rolls along with the cone, but its pollen apparently seems to move a little bit further. 
So with Douglas fir, we have east and west side Douglas fir if you're buying seedlings because they're you know uniquely adapted. So every tree species has a different genetic breadth to it. Okay. All right. Is this is there a place where you can find you know, where they talk about these different trees? No. <laughs> Unless you get into the scientific literature, some of Jerry Rayfeld, R E H F E L D T, because I'm oversimplifying it. And this is why he hates the term. Because Douglas fir in some areas might be specialists, in other areas more of a generalist. Okay, so there are gradients of this genetic diversity that are out there. Okay, and to define one species as a generalist versus one as a specialist, he doesn't like because it depends on geographic region. Okay, and the same may be true for larch. The key is the more isolated population, the more genetically unique it will be. Okay, so. All right, uh, now there's different groups in here, the Climate Change and Genetics Working Group that's looking for different things. But what are they looking for? They're looking for economic benefits. So Weyerhaeuser has this tremendous Doug fir tree breeding program. And so their Doug fir, as you mentioned earlier, uh, grows twice as fast as a normal Doug fir, which is fine for them because they're going to harvest it when it's 30 years old. Same thing with loblolly pine. Southeast, loblolly pine rotation age is 30 years. Now, South America, Chile, there we go has bred a loblolly pine that grows 20 inches in diameter in 15 years. Okay? It is a corn crop, basically. Okay? Now, if you were to take their loblolly pine and plant it out in the wilds, it would probably die. And that gets us to the economics of it. We are now competing with that aspect of it. The, the more expensive the equipment you buy, the, more you're go the faster you're going to have to harvest, the more you need to be in a state like this as opposed to out in Montana. Which makes Montana different. The problem so, is, we were just talking about this at a forestry roundtable, is that you know we need to market our timber as gene, uh, genetic, not genetically altered. There is a niche market for that, you know. Now, do you want to? Is anybody going to pay to build their house out of non-genetically altered lumber versus genetically uh -huh. altered lumber? We're not there yet. Okay. No, rather but we we grow goshawks, grizzly bears, and, and grayling. Well, that's what we we grow. We grow it with our wood. Hey. Uh, there, there are many different angles to this. Now, in Washington, these are seed transfer guidelines for uh, Douglas fir. Okay, this is how specific they've gotten on this. This is not bad. Okay, but the purpose of this is to grow big trees fast. Okay, which is going to be a little different. And I'm going to just skip through a lot of this stuff. But oh my God. Like Washington, you know, isn't the, the east of Washington like like the flathead? Yes. There's, what you're looking at is climatic uh, similarities, okay? So growing degree days, uh, maximum colds and co maximum warm. So they have all that mountain. Well, for certain characteristics. And it's the extreme weather events that make the differences. So, and it's the average. And the problem is if you're managing for an average, you're not managing for extremes. You know, so if you plant eastern Washington Ponderosa pine or Douglas fir here in Montana, it'll probably do fairly well until we get an extreme cold where in the first week of November it drops to 10 below, and then bam, they're going to get hammered. Well, you know, Ponderosa pine didn't used to live in Butte in the 60s and 70s and 80s. It just simply wouldn't survive, and now we've got lots of Ponderosa well, pine. Well, let me address that. Okay, I got way too much data for time here, but uh, let okay. I, I don't. I agree with you, but things change. So if we look at you know a test site for uh, temperature. And this is for, I believe, lodgepole pine across British Columbia. So these are the different populations. And what they look, looked at is the amplitude at which these trees can grow and where they grow maximum. You can see the peak varies a little bit. Oh, wow. But if you want a lodgepole pine that is a generalist, look at this broad range of temperature where it grows well. It comes from this central plateau area in British Columbia. Okay? Whereas if you go to the lodgepole pine found way up there in Northwest Territories, it can get colder than the green by a little bit, but because it's programmed to shut down photosynthesis in a shorter growing season, it will never grow as big as this. So the point is, not all trees are equal, and the way they change is not equal. You may have trees in there that have such wonderful robustness built into them that they will do well everywhere, and you, in that same species, you may have trees that only do well in a certain specific area. Okay, so about the time you think you got it figured out, and there's these nice, simple comparisons, something comes in and, and throws a monkey wrench at you. So, okay, let's scooch on here. So white pine blister rust, okay, it's an introduced uh, canker disease, and so there's been an active breeding program 
that specifically has found that some trees have a resistance mechanism that will drop the whole branch once infected rather than letting that branch infect the main stem. That's the resistance they found. The problem is <clears throat> blister rust is a fungal organism that has multiple generations every year. White pine will have a generation life cycle of 100 to 200 years. So which one do you think will mutate faster and oh. adapt quicker? And they've already found that 60% resistant white pine is no longer 60% resistant because an organi organism that regenerates multiple times every year can adapt a lot quicker. This is where the superbugs, the bacteria and things like that come from, okay? Um, so any organism that uh, regenerates really quickly. So let's get to our, some, some examples. You've all seen this phenomenon across Mo uh, Montana, mountain pine beetle epidemic. Now here's something cool that I want you to think about. I have no proof for this except for I, I spent some time in Germany and worked with some geneticists over there on Norway spruce. And here's what they found in Norway spruce. Uh, Norway spruce in Germany is all select, genetically selected to grow tall, big, and fast quickly. Okay? Its origin is in the Carpathian Mountains where there's original populations. When they tested the genetics of spruce that got attacked by the Ips typographus, their version of mountain pine beetle, versus ones that didn't get attacked. And you see this almost with every tree species. Lodgepole pine, 10 to 20% of all lodgepole pine will survive a mountain pine beetle attack. And it's not because lack of beetles, okay? When you, when you spray these trees with seven and kill all the mountain pine beetles, you'll find, and we've seen this on landowners, you'll find piles of dead mountain pine beetles that deep around the bases of the trees, okay? It's not a lack of mountain pine beetles. The thing is, <clears throat> they're not liking some of these trees. What they found in Norway spruce is the trees that did not get attacked by Ips typographus were genetically much more heterozygous than the trees that were attacked. So the ones that were attacked were very homozygous. The ones that were not attacked were very heterozygous, which means that the heterozygous ones are producing certain compounds that the bark beetle doesn't like. So what we're seeing across Montana now is a natural selection process on a massive scale. Okay. And so these are the ones we want to keep alive producing seeds. These are the ones that are killed by mountain pine beetle that we don't want to reproduce. Here's the hang-up. This has been going on for a long time, so why don't we have larger resistant populations of lodgepole pine? <coughs> lodgepole pine stores its seeds for up to 30 years. Okay? It's a fire resistance adaptation. So with all this fuel buildup, this will burn, which will release the seeds from the mountain pine beetle kill trees. Okay? So I've just made an excuse, a damn good reason, of why we should be salvage harvesting beetle kill trees and keeping these green ones alive because rather than you've heard about assisted migration with climate change, okay? We want to take species from southern locations and plant them here. I'm dead set against that, okay? Because I'll show you a graph. These trees have been in existence for multiple million years, okay? Conifers have been around for 80 million years, okay? These trees have existed in the Northern Rockies for a long, 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 long time. They have the genetic diversity in them to survive any kind of climate change. But what we will see is these types of things where those that are maladapted get killed and those are, that are better adapted survive, okay? So what I'm talking about is assisted adaptation, where we are going to actually help these populations adapt to, say, mountain pine beetle resilience. Now, can I prove any of this? No. Um, is it possible to prove? Absolutely. Um, I'm hoping to get some research going with the uh, Institute in Vienna that does this genome mapping. And all we got to do is sample the beetle killed trees versus the unsampled uh, beetle killed trees and see if there's any difference in homozygosity and heterozygosity. Won't they need fire, though? No. Most, ponder, most lodgepole pines produce both serotonous and non-serotonous okay. cones. Okay. Fire is one adaptation. We have lodgepole pine in the uh, island mountain ranges of central Montana that don't produce serotonous cones. So fire certainly, in a historical sense, helps them regenerate, and that's why we still have lodgepole pine that's as susceptible as it is to mountain pine beetle. Because again, fire will re re erase all of this selection that went on. Because once this burns, it'll kill dead and live trees, and the seeds from both the dead trees and the live trees will regenerate the site. Oh, wow. So what you're saying is get, the, get that dead stuff out of there and then help just... Hitch up the team and go get all the gray ones. Okay, so there's the these things of fitness, okay, and I'm, I'm 
So yeah, we get into this, and you know, here's what these stands look like now. They will burn, okay? They will burn severely, and there will be no differentiation between those who were hit by beetles and those who were not. So let's, I'm running out of time, and there's a main point I want to get to. So there's some other phenomena that you need to be aware about, that the smaller a surviving population that is left, the more limited genetic diversity gets, okay? And it's called inbreeding what happens. Um, all conifers will inbreed. They will self themselves. Their pollen will fertilize their own seeds. Okay? One of the artifacts of inbreeding is dwarfism. Okay? So when you go in a stand of trees, and Douglas fir is notorious for this. You go in a stand of Douglas fir, and you have this carpet of Douglas fir underneath. Okay? And some of the Douglas fir are taller. What you are more than likely seeing is all the short ones are inbred. Okay, they have self themselves. And the taller ones are the ones that are from different families. Okay, and what we find is that um, inbreeding um, is actually uh, multiplies itself. So if you start out with an initial frequency and uh, you have one generation of self fertilization, two generations, three generations, four generations, by the time you're down to your fourth generation, um, you have reduced your genetic diversity uh, by about 90 percent. Okay, now this is how you get individual populations. This is how we get chihuahuas and Irish wolfhounds. It's from inbreeding dogs. Okay, we have siblings mate with each other and they produce all sorts of weird stuff from the because the mutations match up to each other. Okay, most of them are harmful. They die. But some of them are different. We do it with chicken breeding all the time. I mean, that's why you get curly feathered chickens and all this weird stuff. It's all inbreeding that does this. <coughs> all of those, the more specific you get to a breed, the less adaptable it is to a broad variety. And that's why in dogs, what's the most robust, healthiest dog out there? Mutt. The mutt, yeah, because it has the greatest genetic diversity in it. Interesting stuff. So here's what I wanted to get to. And you, this is a pollen analysis. This happens to be out of Foy's Lake out of Kalispell, but it's been done for all of uh, western Montana, out of lake sediment, where you can date this back 13,000 years, because every year spring flood lays down a layer of mud and clay, and captured in that is pollen from the, from the plants that are there. Okay? This is really cool stuff, so here's the date back to 13,000 years. What I wanted to point out is you can separate pollen by species and see when they're around. If we look at, where's my Larch and dug fir. The width of this column is how much pollen there was in the mud. You can see that really Douglas fir and larch didn't appear as a common broad species until 2,000 years ago in Montana. What's the biggest, the age of the biggest larch in Montana? 15, 14 years? It's estimated to be 2,000 years old up at Sealy Lake. Yeah. yeah 2,000 years in a tree is nothing. It's maybe four generations of Douglas fir. Okay, so prior to 2000, you can see that Larch and Douglas fir became less and less. We go back 7,000 years, and it was trace. We go back 11,000 years, it didn't exist. Okay, now the reason I just we were a warmer, drier climate. So here's Artemisia as sagebrush, 2,000 years ago. Okay, now look how much pollen there is in sagebrush around Kalispell before 2,000 years ago, and that's because in climate change, this is one of those things about climate analysis that's fascinating. The first 8,000 years of our last global optimum, let me see, I think I got that chart on. Oh, I'm going to have to switch these around a little bit. Hang on. There we go. The first 8,000 years, this is a logarithmic scale right here, were significantly warmer and drier than the last 2,000 years. Okay? It's only the last 2,000 years that our tree species moved in. Okay? So what's the significance behind that is, whoop, let me go back to this, or this. In a drier, warmer climate, trees will only survive across Montana on microsites. Okay? Little pocket here where fire left them. Or, you know, here's the wrinkles south of Butte on the landscape. Okay, so the north dry the cool wet areas. What are the chances of this population of Douglas fir exchanging pollen with this population of Douglas fir? Very poor. In a hot, dry environment, pollen lives for about five minutes. Only in a cold, in a cool, um, wet environment does pollen live for a longer period of time. 
The thistle seed has to live for three years. Pardon me? The thistle seed has to live for three years. There you go. Well, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, the noxious weeds are noxious for a reason, yeah. okay? They're hard to kill. <laughs> and the interesting thing about noxious weeds is they have genetic diversity like you wouldn't believe. They are adaptable to almost any environment. They're the generalists, okay? The specialists are the ones that develop in these isolated pockets that have unique characteristics. And it's go, oh, isn't that cool? We have Douglas fir here that has corkscrew needles. Okay, how cool is that? We gotta protect it, okay? <laughs> it's a genetic artifact, okay? But, back to my original point. 2,000 years ago, our landscape had little pockets of trees, not the way it does now. The expansiveness of the forest we have now came from these little pockets. So genetically, what does that tell you about our population of trees that we have now across the landscapes? It's all inbred as hell, okay? They originated from a few parents and they have propagated across the landscape. So we have these massive inbred populations of trees across the landscape. And what happens when you have massive inbred populations? The more susceptible to disease. Yeah. An insect and disease comes in and it rectifies the situation. So the mountain pine, I would make the argument that the mountain pine beetle epidemic the white pine blister, all of these things that come in there are actually on a selection scale, evolutionary scale, resetting the bar. Okay, now, so we're all basically doom and gloom, things are going to die and we can't do anything about it. Well, here's the thing. When we select trees out there, there are certain things we can look for to try and increase heterozygosity and diversity. Remember, we used to select trees for the tallest and the fastest growing, right? Well, what Gerhard Miller Stark, the geneticist with Norway Spruce found in Europe is that trees that put on the biggest diameter growth and the tallest height growth are the most homozygous and the most susceptible to Ips typographus. And the ones that are intermediates, not, not the suppressed, okay? Because remember, inbreeding depression is also a, a, one of the artifacts of that is dwarfism. So really, when you're selecting what you need to be selecting for, based on this theory, and it is theory, okay? It's not proven in any way. I wouldn't bet my children's lives on it, or my own, as a matter of fact, but it stands to reason. We need to be selecting for the co-dominants that have decent looking crowns. If you're only selecting for the tallest trees, you may be selecting for those that are most susceptible to pests and pathogens, because according to this genetics research, they are most homozygous and they're putting all their eggs in one basket and that's height growth. So all the stuff that we've been practicing for all these years of selecting for the tallest, fastest growing trees, we might have actually been selecting against robustness on there. The same thing is with cereal grains and all, all the other things that we do out there. So this is some of the uh, interesting stuff to think about that when we're thinning, um, by thinning, we also have to think of, let me go back to this, when you see a group of trees, there's a high probability they're all related up to a certain distance based on how far pollen flies and how far seed transfer is, okay? With larch, there's a greater probability that there is a broad genetic diversity into them. With ponderosa pine, whose seed only travels by rolling in a cone, chances are that all of these little seedlings are from one family. They're all related, okay? now. Here's where it gets really screwy. Our natural tendency, if we thin this, is we're going to leave the best, right, the tallest ones. What this other theory says is we should not select the tallest ones because they're probably homozygous for growing tall fast. They're inbred. On the other hand, the short ones are also homozygous. They're the inbred showing dwarfism. So probably our selection guideline should be for the intermediate ones show the best color and the best needle retention that have certain, because by needle retention and needle color, they're showing that they're well adapted to the site. They're well adapted to the site because they may have the genetic diversity to deal with the hot and the drought and the cold extremes that are out there. So everything we do out there, when it's thinning or selecting, we are affecting the genetics that are out there. So here, two ponderosa pines next to each other, they're pretty well spaced. This one has really, has a Q-tip needle uh, branch on it, okay? Short needle retention, um, not a lot of needle growth. This one, in comparison, better color, so better chlorophyll, 
better physiology, it has better needle retention on it. Now, is it because this one's grown on a big rock and this one's growing in, an, in a deep pocket of soil? It may be. Separating out environmental effects and genetics is extremely difficult. What you're looking for is a pattern. If you see a pattern over and over and over and over again, then you can start developing a little bit of a selection guide for yourself. And the thing about it is, because of the uniqueness of the Northern Rockies, every site may have different patterns. And this is where you as landowners are, have the potential of being the expert what's doing well on your property. And as I tell folks, vigilance and observation. Watch your trees. I have 20 acres. I walk it every day. I still learn stuff. I made some big mistakes early on because I left some bigger, when I came to a selection like this, um, well, here, I'll give you another a different example. That, I'll back up to that. But I wanted to, different crown characteristics. So, ponderosa pine, top killed by Ips. Okay, I had a tree like this and a couple trees next to it that were just grown gangbusters. And I did some thinning. Which one do you think I took? That one, okay, because it had been top killed by Ips. Four years later, my super fast growing ponderosa pines got hammered by mountain pine beetle. Bam, they were dead. So here's an interesting thing, and it's species specific, okay? What I observed, now there's no proof to this other than my observation, is there's also this thing called grow or defend conundrum with trees. Genes can be turned on and off, sometimes with outside stimulus, okay? And what I've observed is ponderosa pine that gets top killed seems to be sometimes the last one that gets hit by mountain pine beetle when it comes into a stand. And so there is some evidence physiologically with plants that it's called a wounding response. When a plant is wounded, it will shift its genetic emphasis. And so with ponderosa pine, based on my observation and this research, is that when ponderosa pine is injured, it shifts its carbon allocation from growth to defense. Okay, and so <clears throat> this is my property. I was el helping a landowner uh, with some marking, and we looked at this tree and said, you know, here's, here's some thoughts on this. You know, this might be the most robust ponderosa pine on the site now because it's putting it all into defense, and it might be a good one to leave. Landowner said, no, I don't like the dead top, take it. Okay, and so this one went, and some of these other ones left. Uh, so I'm going to back up here real quick and just show you a few other things that, that we do sort of know about pines, uh, ponderosa pine. So I look at these crowns, <clears throat> and they all look pretty good. Branch angle is an interesting thing with ponderosa pine. Some ponderosa pines have horizontal branches, and some of them have these real angular branches. Okay, And again, there is no scientific proof that would call a, a big survey, but uh, this has been noticed by a lot of folks that... The pines that have these angled branches seem to be more susceptible to needle cast diseases. There seems to be a relationship there. Now, the wood products industry doesn't like these because the angled branches make long knots in the wood. Okay, so that was a reason for selecting against them for value. But I've also noticed that the angled branches on my property, every pine that has angled branches like that uh, is suffering from needle cast, where the ones that don't have that are not suffering from needle cast. So I'm starting to select against them. You know, This is where localized observation comes into play. Um, things that you can uh, uh, look at. Now, other things. So here's a pine that's growing narrow crown, growing, put on a lot of height growth. Here's some that grown wider and shorter, still pretty good height growth. I would call this, if they're right next to each other, dominant and co-dominant. Okay? Another thing I've observed with ponderosa pines, however, is that the ones that grow, grow the fastest seem to be the first ones hit by mountain pine beetle or western pine beetle. Um, it's just like they're putting all their energy into growth and none into defense mechanisms until they're triggered like a wounding response. Now Douglas fir or grand fir are very very different so if we go back to this where is it? Go back to this example if this is a Douglas fir that's top killed by Doug fir beetle, or a grand fir that's top killed uh, by fir engraver, within five years it's going to be dead. 
different physiology, different response. So you can't apply the same rules to every tree species. Every tree species is going to be a little different in that way. Uh, larch seems to be somewhat analogous to this. That our biggest, oldest larch in the Gerard Larch Grove, all of them are, have been top killed and they're alive. So it changes a little bit of our paradigm of how we view genetics, okay? Where historically, the biggest was the best. And what this new evidence seems to indicate is the intermediate is the best. Unless it's, the difference is because of growing condition, okay? Something may be intermediate because it's not growing on as good a site as something that's growing on an ideal site. Now, the final tidbit of evidence on this is the tree nutrition co-op that did all these fertilization trials over in Idaho and northern Washington and even some in Montana found that when they added nitrogen fertilizer to ponderosa pine, growth improved, but within 10 years, almost all those ponderosa pines got hit by a mountain pine beetle or western pine beetle, okay? Because nitrogen stimulates ponderosa pines to grow like mad. It's like giving your five-year-old kid a one-pound chocolate bar before bed, okay? And what do bark beetles want? They want the sugar in the wood, okay? So a super suppressed tree doesn't offer them the food they need for reproductive purposes. They're really sampling trees that have a high sugar content and no defense, which be, would be upon rosapine on steroids or nitrogen, okay? Now, does Doug fir behave the same way? No evidence to that, okay? Potentially spruce responds better to nitrogen because it's nitrogen limited species, more nitrogen, and it can bolster its defense mechanism. So it's kind of like us taking vitamins. Do vitamins help us or hurt us? Well, you know, it might be more analogous to us eating sugar, which makes our metabolism go crazy but suppresses our immune system, versus taking my vitamins that don't make us necessarily grow faster but increases our resistance mechanism. You know, trees operate the same way, but again, I, I hopefully I've emphasized enough, every species is different. And even species in locales may be reacting a little different. And this is what makes genetics fascinating and frustrating. Because we try to work on averages. So we would sample trees all across Montana and Idaho and eastern Washington and come up with these averages when the reality is that these trees across these areas may be uniquely and genetically different. Population in this valley may have a lot of heterozygosity and the population in the next valley may have a lot of homozygosity. But when you're selecting on your own property and your own trees, something that should be in the back of your mind is, okay, am I selecting trees because they all look alike? Uh, if I have a group of isolated pine trees in this one pocket, chances are they're all related. And inbreeding might be a problem in there. So by spacing it out, I might get pollen from further areas to do some crossbreeding and produce a more robust offspring than if I'm just keeping the three tallest trees in this one area that may be related and in that process I'm just really selecting for a hybrid that grows tall. Yes? So when you're, if you're hiring someone to help you do um, a harvest, how much of this is being used? You know, if you want something to come in and mark your trees? Mm -hmm. What they're selecting for are the best crowns and the tallest trees. Yeah. Those are the standard marking guides. And that's why you need to be there with the persons that are marking your tree and calibrate them. Say, this is what I'm doing here. Um, on the property, the landowner that I worked with is a longtime friend of mine, had 130 acres that were being marked. We bet, went back and remarked 50% of the trees because we were looking at different things. And it was, we were selecting against Douglas fir for larch when, there was, when things were equal and ponderosa pine was intermediate, but then we're looking at these other characteristics, you know, the, the potential genetic implications. All right, I've kept you too long, so thanks for listening <laughs> patiently, and uh, you better get going to your next class. I have a question. Did you take the, po the photograph that your feet started with, the one with the rainbow Yes. It? It's beautiful. Thank you. Uh, yes. It's my driveway. <laughs> oh, really? It is a great photo. Thank you. Are you, are you here or in those? I'm here. You're here. Yeah, I live up in Everill. Okay. And I'm housed here. Okay. Okay. Peter, what do you uh, figure the <laughs> long term thing with the uh, blister rust will be? Well, there will be some level of resistance, but you'll never have complete resistance. Because the mechanism 
right now is simply the tree will upsize the branch that has blister rust, but some still gets onto the stem. So it'll be a chronic issue, um, but white pine as a species will will survive. It may become a little bit more prevalent, but it'll never be the dominant that it was before, in my opinion. Now, I'm originally from California, and I'm, I see that the white bark pine is doing much better there than it is in Montana. Um, what do you make of that? Um, well, it's uh, site specific. Okay, it's warmer, drier there. It may have some resistance to blister rust. Um, it's a blister rust and mountain pine beetle that's working together on white bark pine. And so, you know, with uh, warmer, warmer winters, uh, warmer summers, mountain pine beetle's been moving up in elevation. It, in California, in the Sierras, it may have been working with uh, with uh, mountain pine beetle before already and have developed some resistance mechanisms. Who knows? Yeah. You know. Tough to know. Well, you can speculate, but you know, speculation is cheap. Yeah. <laughs>